the Shark Deck. Thank you, audience of five people. Hi, my air name is Johnny Mac, and this is Daily Comedy News. President Biden headed off to Israel. Jimmy Kimmel asked, wasn't sending an 80-year-old on a dangerous mission across the globe the plot of the last Indiana Jones movie? And I'm not sure that went great. Michael Costa, hosting The Daily Show this week, had some good ones. He pointed out Biden is 80 years old, so he did get to the airport two days ago. And let's be honest, Biden doing anything pretty much puts him in harm's way. A rocket strike is dangerous, but so is a bicycle. Cost again, I bet he can cool things down, because if there's one thing Biden's good at, it's cooling things down, whether it's a war, heated rhetoric, or voter enthusiasm. <laughs> All right, now that I've ticked off half of you, let's tick off the other side. A judge imposed a limited gag order on President Trump on Monday. Michael Costa again said, good luck getting Trump to stop talking. The guy's probably still spilling national secrets just out on the golf course. Like, should I go with a four iron or a five iron? That reminds me, four and five, those are the first two numbers in the nuclear codes. Guess what numbers come next? You'll never guess. I'll just tell you. <laughs> Kimmel went with Trump's lawyer, said Trump had no intention of intimidating any witnesses or court staff, including the judge. You know, the one that lives at 2747 Maple View Lane, white Nissan Sentra parked outside. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Colbert has COVID again. He did the show from home on Monday. Tuesday, there was no show. Wednesday, I don't know what happened. I don't record this after 1130 at night. I go to bed. Bad Bunny will host and be the musical guest on SNL this week. But looking ahead to the 28th, Nate Bergazzi and the Foo Fighters. So awesome musical guest. And Nate Bergazzi now big enough to host SNL. Very interesting. Pete Holmes has a Netflix special next week. I didn't know this was coming. I was so excited when I saw it. It is called Pete Holmes, I Am Not For Everyone. The trailer is out. Let's take a quick listen. I knew I was in trouble during the lockdown because I went back to eating Cool Ranch Doritos. That's the right response. It's a perfect chip. Told you to be a quick listen. Pete Holmes, I Am Not For Everyone on Netflix, October 24th. A really, really good interview with Roy Wood Jr. in Rolling Stone. I have shared that in the Facebook group. Please feel encouraged to join the Facebook group. It is called Daily Comedy News Podcast Group. They asked Roy how the writer strike changed his view of the industry. Very interesting. Roy said, people said content is king, but now I think audience is king. And the ones who will find an audience will be more in control of their fate. Hello from the basement. I feel you. People used to say you're talented. Let's find you an audience. But now you're expected to have an audience. Z-Way is a great example from a couple years ago. A lot of what became Z-Way's show was because she built an audience for herself. And then Showtime came. The Pat McAfee deal with ESPN is a very telling sign. He essentially started a podcast, found an audience, and then ESPN said, that's a nice audience you have. We can bring them over here. The writer strike forced a lot of people into looking at what can I do in the meantime until my job comes back? And I think a lot of people are going to discover they're happier doing other things than their old job. Hello again from the basement. Yes. Roy continued, said, you can tell me whatever you want to tell me about late night, but if CBS has chosen to replace their 1230 show with something cheaper, that says something. Doesn't mean that at midnight isn't entertaining, but it means the networks are looking for cheaper ways to engage people in the same medium. The thing that's dangerous for late night is that the cheaper they're going to make their late night, the more affordable you're making it for regular people to compete in the space. The audience numbers are already starting to approach that in terms of YouTube versus streaming. I spent some time this summer thinking, what would I want to do in this space? What would actually get greenlit? And of what would be greenlit, what can I actually do myself? They asked him about stepping away from his job as a correspondent on The Daily Show. Roy Wood Jr. said, think of it like football. The job of the correspondent is the wide receiver and the host is the quarterback. And I don't know that I'm going to be chosen as host. And if I'm not chosen a host, I don't know if the new host, A, will want me or B, is running an offense that fits me as a wide receiver. There's a world where I still get offered the show and there's a world where I get offered something else. But I just know to figure out what I want to do next just as a contingency to cover my own hat. I can't do that while I'm doing my job as correspondent. It would disrespect the job of correspondent. Pointed question here. Did they tell you that you didn't get the Daily Show hosting job? His answer, when I saw the Hassan Minhaj stuff out, I think it was pretty clear that Hassan was the front runner. I haven't heard that it's for sure, Hassan. All I've heard is that they're still deciding a really good interview. I'll do more of it on Friday and Saturday. Uh, as for the Daily Show hosting job, yeah, I, I, I don't I don't think they can give it to Hassan now, right? The whole thing, I get it's comedy news, but like Jon Stewart did kind of create this air of authority that uh, Trevor continued. And I think if you have a guy up there that did something similar in a stand-up special that uh, was kind of made up, I'm not sure that's going to work for the Daily Show. Collider asked, do we even want a Seinfeld reunion? Good point. I'm going to say no. And what's weird is I actually had a dream last night about the Seinfeld reunion. And in my dreams version of the reunion, they had the four characters in separate plots as if they had shot it during uh, COVID. And the episode did not work in Dreamland. But Collider writes, 
what happens? Are the Seinfeld Four now out of jail and back to living their sad single lives as if nothing ever happened? Do we want Jerry and George at the diner complaining about their love lives in their 60s? Do we give everyone a family and kids? To do so would almost be a betrayal of their characters. If anyone seemed destined to be alone forever, it's them. There's also the question of where Seinfeld would return to. The days of monstrous ratings are over. Streaming options and cable have made it impossible for tens of millions to watch the same show at the same time. Would a Seinfeld reunion end up on Peacock or Netflix? Becoming something we now binge alone on our phones rather than a shared cultural moment? That feels sad and small for something that was so big. Yes, that's a good point. Vulture caught up with the creators of the new, new Frasier. Good interview with showrunners Joe Cristalli and Chris Harris. Apparently, Kelsey Grammer had been wanting to reboot Frasier since 2018. The showrunners say one of the priorities was getting David Hyde Pierce back to play Niles. In that version, New New Frasier would have been about the brothers owning a black box theater. When David Hyde Pierce decided not to do it, they started over. Cristalli says he's not the bad guy in this, and he was so lovely about it, and that gave them a chance to start over. And they decided for Frasier, for both his professional world and personal relationships, it feels like it's a time for Frasier to be giving back. Cristalli said, Kelsey told us Frasier never really had a good friend, and we should find him one. On Cheers, he was the one on the outside looking in all those people. On Frasier, he had Niles, but that's a brother. Kelsey wanted a relationship with an old friend that he could go back and forth with in a way that's different and distinct from Niles. As soon as you see Alan interact with Frasier, he's a completely different version of anything we've seen as a foil for a while. Chris Harris said, We went through many incarnations. The university was in some versions and not in other versions. And there was a theater in one of them. It felt like, what's giving meaning in this next stage of life? Cristalli said, yeah, it was hard for Frazier and Niles to run the theater when you don't have Niles, so we had to step back from that. Kamel Nanjiani will co-star with Sam Rockwell in the upcoming dark comedy, A Guy Walks Into a Bar. In A Guy Walks Into a Bar, a mild-mannered new father, played by Kamel Nanjiani, befriends a charismatic yet mysterious man, played by Sam Rockwell, at a bar and soon suspects him of concealing a troubling secret, all right? Ryan Reynolds was remembering Robin Williams. Last week, Ryan accepted the Robin Williams Legacy of Laughter Award. The other night on Instagram, Ryan shared some photos from the event and captioned it, I miss Robin Williams. Pretty sure everyone does. His kids have turned his legacy into a living, breathing love letter for good. It was a crazy honor to receive the Robin Williams Legacy Award last week at the annual Bring Change to Mind Gala in New York City. More Robin Williams from Vice TV's Dark Side of Comedy. Friends of Robin are saying close to his death that Robin wasn't recognizing them. Comedian Stephen Pearl said, The last time I saw Robin Williams, I hadn't seen him for a few months and he was thin and he didn't recognize my wife. He hardly said a word. It took him a second to recognize me. I go, whoa, something's wrong here. I didn't know what. Nobody would really tell me. And then I never saw him again after that. Rick Overton said the exchanges in text were becoming more abbreviated. Shorter sentences, all good, all lovely. It was just everything was shortening. I knew there was a change. Williams' best friend of 42 years, actor Stanley Wilson, said occasionally he would repeat things in a phone call that he had said. That was really unusual. The Zoe Report caught up with Atsuko at Katsuko, who's having a moment here. Atsuko talked about her new look and said, I'm trying to do an Atsuko 3.0 in my new tour with my new look. It is the full-grown tour. It kicked off in Honolulu on September 29th. Atsuko said, I'm trying to push how much more I can go for an avant-garde look. Bigger shoulders, more shapes. Stuff that still allows me to move around a lot. If I could, I would wear clothes that are not easy to move in because it looks so fun. I want even bigger shapes and maybe something dragging on the floor, but I have to tone it down so I don't fall and trip and have to stop the show because I'm going to the emergency room. And this article mentions the deodorant company again. Boy, they are getting their money's worth with Otsko. Except I haven't said the name of the deodorant once, have I? No. Call me Deodorant Company. I'll sell the whole thing. Daily Comedy News brought to you by Deodorant Company. Every third story can be about deodorant. I like money. Otsko practices her routine at home in her planned outfit. That to develop the physical comedy, troubleshoot any hazards, and stay comfortable. Osco says, in my messaging with comedy and also the way I dress, it's all spreading joy and a sense of embracing who you are, being your weird self. Love it. Great attitude. This February, the Canadian Comedy Hall of Fame will induct somebody, but there's a vote. Some of the people up for your vote, Jim Carrey, Eugene Levy, Martin Short, but also the entire cast of SCTV, as well as Canadian comics Steve Smith and Avira Kurt. Who's in the Canadian Comedy Hall of Fame, you're wondering? Well, I'll tell you. Some of the people are John Candy, Norm MacDonald, Lorne Michaels, Catherine O'Hara, Phil Hartman, Leslie Nielsen, Dan Aykroyd, and Michael J. Fox. The mission statement of the Canadian Comedy Hall of Fame is to celebrate, promote, and preserve Canadian achievements in comedy. 
Truth is, our British, American, and indigenous influences combine with a mosaic of culture expression to form a worldview that creates not only a unique Canadian take on the world, but a take the world can laugh at. Besides, it's cold for six months and you have to do something to keep warm. <laughs> so, let me take a quick time out here. I'm recording this after I put the whole podcast together. In the next section here, I'm going to discuss Israel through a comedic lens. This is not a political show. And I saw a couple articles that were pretty interesting, and I wanted to share them. And I keep thinking about the different styles of comedy. Yes, you can do Stephen Wright, Mitch Hedberg style one-liners, and then you can be George Carlin late in career and make very political observations through the lens of comedy. And I think the forum of comedy is a great place to exchange ideas. So you're about to hear me uh, tell you a story from uh, comedian Basim Youssef, who was on with Piers Morgan. It gets very, very pointed. Uh, I hope it doesn't chase you away, but my spirit here is not to ignore a major topic, and I know that the late night shows are also struggling with this, um, but you know, we saw this after 9-11 as well, and there are things you just can't ignore, so we'll take a look at them through the comedy lens. So let's jump back into the tape, but again, I'll, I'll pre-warn you, some of this Basim Youssef stuff is quite pointed, and I'm going to deliberately read most of it verbatim and flat so that I'm not putting any kind of spin on it. I'm just trying to report on the comedy news. All right, let me take a sip of my coffee here. Here it is. I have decided that this will be the point in the podcast where I will discuss Israel. We're going to get a little serious here for a second, uh, but everything I share with you does have jokes around it. By the way, uh, Amy Schumer is posting a lot on her Instagram. I want to stay on the comedy side of things. This is not a political show, um, but I'm looking here. I just went on Instagram.com slash Amy Schumer. Um, she has several long statements here. She talked about the poor six-year-old who was killed in Chicago. You'd have to go back at least 12 posts before Amy was on a different topic, clearly an important topic. So Egyptian comedian Bassem Youssef was on with Piers Morgan. I saw a lot of clips on this on the Internet as I was putting the show together today. Youssef said his wife's relative's house was bombed in Gaza. Youssef remarked sarcastically, I'm going to read it verbatim and I'm going to read it neutral. It's very repetitive. We are used to that. It's just like those Palestinians are very dramatic. Oh, Israel's killing us, but they never die. They always come back. They are very difficult to kill. I know because I'm married to one. I tried many times, couldn't kill. I tried to get to her many times, but she uses our kids as human shields. I can never take her out. Yousef said all that with a straight face. Earlier on Piers Morgan's show, Ben Shapiro had said, and I'll quote it verbatim, the only solution to the Israel-Gaza conflict is that Israel should annex Gaza and kill as many people so that what's happening does not happen again. Youssef's comment on that, I'll read it verbatim and flat, quote, More than 3,500 people have so far been killed. How many more people do we need to kill so that Ben Shapiro is happy? Youssef took on the Israeli military and said, again, I will read it flat and verbatim, I applaud Israel for doing something no military force in the world does. It warns civilians before bombing them. That is so cute. I asked my wife's family if Hamas forced them to stay home so they could be bombed and could be used as a human shield, and she denied. Awkwardly switching topics. The 10,000 Laughs Comedy Festival was last week, and the Star Tribune took a look at some comedians that they think could be big in the future. The Star Tribune wrote, The real thrill for comedy geeks is the chance to discover talents on the verge of blowing up. Here are five with outstanding potential. They picked Jordan Jensen out of New York. They enjoyed her taping of her podcast, Being Eaten with Jordan with Ian Fidance. And they wrote, The pair have a brother-sister vibe, although I'm not sure how many siblings swap sex tales in such graphic detail. Don't be surprised if Jensen is routinely filling theaters this time next year. Dan Mintz on their list? Now, supposedly, Dan Mintz voices Tina Belcher on Bob's Burgers? Yeah? They fell for this hoax. Two questions if you're a new listener. One, have you ever seen Bob's Burgers? The answer is no. Two, have you ever met anyone who's seen Bob's Burgers? I know you've seen promos for it. I know you hear Kevin Burkhart promoting it during football games. But have you ever actually seen the show? No. Fox just puts up a test pattern claiming to be Bob's Burgers. They know we're all watching football. Dan Mintz follows in the footsteps of Stephen Wright, delivering a steady stream of brilliant one-liners that rely heavily on wordplay and impeccable timing. One joke, I want to die surrounded by family, but when I'm not around family, I feel fine. They also enjoyed Salma Zeki and Jerry Hamedi, Zeki, a Denver-based comic who mine laughs out of getting a DUI. Hamedi shared clever observations about growing up Iranian in the Midwest. And Kelsey Cook made the list. And the Star Tribune says Cook has such a girl-next-door delivery that her filthy material can come across like children's bedtime stories. 
Vulture has the 25 comedians you should know or whatever it's called. Uh, one of them, Katrina Cook. And they asked Katrina what she's learned about her own joke writing process. Katrina said, I move through material quickly, sometimes a little too quickly. I get sick of hearing myself say the same thing. So I try to start with newer material and switch things up with stories that pop into my head when I hear the other comics go up. Makes it feel more natural and conversational for me to mildly tailor my set to what's already been discussed or not discussed at a show. They asked Katrina about her unpopular comedy opinions. What hill will you die on? Katrina said, you can wear shorts on stage. Climate change is real and performers should be allowed to adapt. I heard John Cena pushes for wardrobe to let him wear shorts because they're more comfortable for his massive calves. I think comedians should be allowed similar performative freedoms. Best comedy advice, worst comedy advice, best. Are they paying you? A comedian I love and respect overheard me talking about a bigger opportunity I'd just gotten. She suddenly leaned over and said, are they paying you? When I said yes, she said, good. Worst. You should be more like blank. It's hard enough for me to make sure I'm being the best version of myself. I can't be adding all kinds of other people into the mix. And that's your comedy news for today. If you enjoy the show, tell a friend about it. And you can all follow it on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or YouTube for free. And I'll see you tomorrow.